Welcome back. It's Score Study with me, Brian Kroc. So I've got so much to say about Georgi Ligeti. Georgi Ligeti. That I've split this lesson up into two videos. This week, I'm analyzing fanfares from his first book of piano etudes. And next week, I'm gonna show you how I went about arranging this virtuosic solo piano piece for my big band, Big Heart Machine. It was crazy. Georgi Ligeti was born in Transylvania, Romania, in 1923. His early life was challenging for a variety of reasons. His father and brother died in concentration camps in the Second World War, and his early career consisted of a low-paid teaching gig at the Franz Liszt Academy in Budapest, where he was also expected to arrange nationalist choral music under the strict Soviet dictatorship. He knew little of contemporary music being produced by his, well, contemporaries elsewhere in the world. Because modernist music was considered Western and therefore bad, he had to have scores smuggled to him illegally. In this way, he became familiar with early 20th century composers like say Bartok or Schoenberg, but he knew little of say Boulez or Stockhausen. Under these circumstances, wouldn't it be hard to find the time and mental capacity to also compose groundbreaking new music. I've always found it deeply inspiring that Ligeti wrote his first mature compositions for the drawer, in his words, meaning that he filed them away as soon as they were finished without hope of ever hearing them performed. In 1956, he fled communist Hungary with his family, circuitously arriving in Cologne after many difficult setbacks. But once there, he caused a huge stir in the classical music community in part because his music shared none of the sort of Darmstadt school influences that were in vogue at the time. During the 60s and 70s, he wrote a lot of awesome music. You've probably heard Ligeti's music, even if you think you haven't. Stanley Kubrick used a whopping 30 minutes of Ligeti's music without his permission in his 1968 film, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Ligeti was told by Kubrick's people that he should consider himself lucky for the exposure. Does that sound familiar to any of my fellow musicians out there? Apparently Kubrick didn't know permission wasn't obtained for the music. You can look it up. There was a lot of drama around the soundtrack for that movie. Ligeti liked the film and ended up allowing Kubrick to use his music for two other films, The Shining and Eyes Wide Shut. This all brings us to 1985, when Ligeti's first book of piano etudes was published. This collection of pieces has to be one of the most influential, important contributions to music composition in the 20th century. The etudes were eventually fleshed out in three books, which contain stunning variety, ingenuity, virtuosity, and they're just really awesome. The sheer breadth of influences that Ligeti draws from in this short piece is astounding. First of all, Ligeti had a deep reverence for music history, as you will see again and again in this video. Just check out the similarity between this piece by Johannes Akagem, a canon for 36 voices, and tell me you don't see the similarity to Ligeti's Lantano, which is essentially a canon for every voice in the orchestra.
Ligeti described Akagem's counterpoint thusly, a continuous surge lacking any culmination or development. He showed me the possibility of writing music which seems to stand still and yet flows on. This idea became central to much of Ligeti's writing. He liked to imagine his music as infinite, sounding continuously, and the listener simply approaches it, passes by, and moves away. That could certainly describe fanfares, which features an insistent rising eighth note figure, which repeats literally 208 times in this short three minute work. Speaking of Ligeti's reverence for history, just listen to a bit of Bela Bartok's Six Dances in Bulgarian Rhythm. the similarity is striking. We know that Ligeti shared his Hungarian heritage with Bartok, and obviously he was deeply indebted to him as a composer. In fact, only two months before the premiere of Fanfares, its title was Bartok. Bartok? Bartok? Bartokay? This ever-present rising figure is something called an oxok, a term from Ottoman music theory, which means limping or stumbling, and refers to a rhythmic matrix comprised of juxtaposed binary and ternary rhythmic cells. In this case, the rhythmic cell is three plus two plus three. One, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. In the score, Ligeti writes, the ostinato figure should be clearly accentuated as three plus two plus three throughout. Do not accentuate the first beat of the bar any more than the subdivisions there should be no feeling of entire bars. This is another idea that one finds in Ligeti scores again and again and again. Bar lines are simply present to enable synchronization, but never represent a stressed beat or groove. That also adds to the whole feeling of infinity. Just as the incessant rhythm of this oxoc points towards infinity, so does the pitch material. While the rising left-hand figure sort of sounds like a major scale that never quite reaches the octave, it's actually two major tetrachords are tritone apart. It sort of reminds me of an ever-rising barber pole. One can't help also being reminded of the Dutch artist M.C. Escher, who Ligeti happened to be fascinated by. Just as Escher toyed with perspective to create physically impossible illusions, Ligeti seems to do so here with his pitch material. The ever-present barber pole scale as I'm dubbing it, apparently, makes this one of the more a 2 d of the etudes. It would totally be at home in a collection of scale exercises. We can't forget that Ligeti, who was not a pianist, was writing this music, after all, as a challenge to concert pianists. In a theme that I imagine will run throughout this whole series of score study videos, Ligeti advocates thinking about the performer's comfort when composing. He says, the criteria are only partly determined in my imagination. To some extent, they also lie in the nature of the piano. I have to feel them out with my hand. A well-formed piano work produces physical pleasure. And remember what I said about historical influences? Well, the pianistic references are manifold in the etudes. He was probably thinking of like Debussy's etudes, or box 24 Preludes and Fugues when he decided to organize the etudes into two and finally three books. In fanfare specifically, Schumann's Chrysleriana is an obvious touchstone. <laughs> Ligeti liked the peculiar impulse of Schumann's fast movements and the, in his words, liana-like burgeoning of secondary voices. Ligeti, as was his wont, takes the idea to its extreme. At times, it sounds like the pianist needs three or even four hands to accommodate the profusion of centripetally dispersing filigree. So how did Ligeti choose the pitches for the vaguely tonal melody initiated in measure two. If you examine the vertical sonority of each dyad, you will find that the barber pole scale completes a major triad. So, C major, F major, etc. The pattern continues. 
Then in measure 10, the hands switch. When the dyads are below the barber pole scale, the rule seems to be that they create a minor triad. What I love so much about so many of Ligeti's forms is that they often consist of establishing a set of rules and then simply following those rules to completion. Something like a mathematician working out a proof. In measure 88, there is a big shift in the rules that govern the piece. Now, Ligeti begins freely combining major and minor triads. At the same moment, he offers us a clue as to how he named the piece. Sounds familiar. Almost like a fanfare. I've always loved the term horn fifths because of how inaccurately it describes what it actually is. See, back in the day, French horns didn't have vowels. They had crooks. That's a long story, but what that means is that they could only play the notes that are present in the overtone series. So if you wanted to harmonize a simple melody, something like just the root, second, and third, you'd have no choice but to use a sixth, followed by a fifth, followed by a major third. Anyways, in measure 116, these melodic events become closer together spatially and they occur more often. This is when things really start to go off the rails. When the hands are switching, they're also pushing the boundaries of the range of the piano. In measure 201, an attempt is made to begin again, but it's too late. The barber pole scale flies off the top of the piano's range and disappears as the dynamics get softer and softer. If this doesn't give the listener an impression of infinity, I don't know what music possibly could. This kind of ending, where the music gets higher and higher until it disappears, is now all too common in modern classical music. It seems to be a favorite device of British composer Thomas Addis, for one. That is just one example of the plethora of ingenious new ideas that occur throughout the piano etudes, and which have been borrowed by countless composers ever since, including myself in a big way. So check out part two of this video to see how I went about arranging fanfares for my big band. If you'd like to support this endeavor of making these score study videos, please, first of all, like and subscribe to my YouTube channel because I've got a lot more coming. And secondly, consider supporting me as a patron on my Patreon page. I'll be posting additional content related to each score study video. So for example, for this video, I'm posting some things that we can practice that use the barber pole scale. I'm also gonna be posting different rhythmic exercises that we can do, which utilize the ox sock from fanfares. And there's a lot more great content on my Patreon page. I'm posting behind the scenes videos, as well as alternate takes of songs from my records. And it's been a great way for me to connect with people who are interested in the work that I'm doing. You can find a link to my Patreon page in the description of this video. You can also find my original music and more. Thanks again for listening. Stay tuned for part two of this Ligeti series.